Hello everybody, this is Chris, and I'm back again. Like, subscribe, and share with your friends. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Great Fire of St. John. So we're here at the New Brunswick Museum's website. St. John's Great Fire happened in 1877, so we're just going to read a little bit here about what they say happened. It began about 2.30 on the 20th of June when sparks fell into a bundle of hay in Henry Fairweather's storehouse on the York Point Slip area, which in present day is in the vicinity of Market Square. It is unknown where the spark originated from. Oh, really? It may have come from McLaughlin and Sons boiler shop next door, or may have been carried from a nearby sawmill. The month of June had been warm with fine weather and little or no rain. Yeah, like that happens in St. John. <laughs> Wooden structures predominant in St. John at the time were tinder, dry, and highly flammable. When the fire was discovered, it was already burning rapidly in large bundles of hay and aided by a fresh, strong breeze, it rapidly escalated into a major conflagration. Within two minutes of the alarm sounding, engine three was dousing the fire. Although other engines followed immediately, the fire had already spread by means of heat and sparks to other wooden structures nearby. At times, the fire reached temperatures perhaps so high, some buildings exploded into flames without actually contacting the fire. This prompted fearful rumors that the fire was intentionally set. <laughs> they said it, not me. When it was all over, the fire had destroyed 80 hectares or 200 acres and 1,612 structures, including eight churches, six banks, 14 hotels, 11 schooners, and four wooden boats in just over nine hours. To make matters worse, less than a quarter of the $28 million in losses were covered by insurance. Pretty crazy, eh? They just, you know, hung those people out to dry. Uh, 19 people died as a direct result of the fire. There was an undetermined number of injuries. The fire made headlines worldwide and assistance began to pour in. Cities from San Francisco to Glasgow donated funds and in total over 225000 was received. Oh, cool. So Chicago hooked us up with some cash. Uh, the feds put in a measly $20,000. Yeah, hundreds and builders, buildings and churches offered help. The Independent Order of the Good Fellows and other fraternal societies organized relief efforts to aid fire victims. The order raised $4,000 itself by canvassing membership throughout Canada and the U.S. despite the organization's headquarters in St. John being burned out. So we're going to see a little bit more about these guys later. I got a nice, pretty interesting picture with those guys. Down here we got the post office, the, the new post office, what they're calling the new post office, and the customs house were both destroyed. This is the custom house that burnt down in the Great Fire. Real old looking. Yeah, and there it is again. Nice big old building. It's all right. And this is the old post office. This, uh, sorry, the new post office. Big old chrome top on there with the Antiquitec pointing out. There's another photo of it. Can't blow it up too big. It's all pixelated. And that is what an actual picture of it looks like. Look how nice that bad boy is. All got all the pillars in there. Whole bunch of chimneys. Another copper top. Just a beautiful, beautiful building. So this was only, pretty much only in use for like 25 years. I'm going to de devote a whole video just to this building because it is a crazy old building. The new building has some crazy uh, stuff to it. And that is the building that replaced the old post office. Still really, really beautiful. Still got the copper top. And yeah, it's just really nice. Like it's got the old brick from the previous building with the mud flood windows going all the way down, all the way along. Yeah, so down at the bottom here, you guys can just uh, continue to read all this if you want to. You can pause it and do what you gotta do. In the fire, no fewer than five photography studios were destroyed. In some cases, years of negatives and proof ledgers among the business papers have disappeared. Fortunately though, 
images of St. John from the late 1850s to June 1877 had been printed and sold, so a record of the urban landscape was preserved. So I took a little trip down to the library and I found this article in amongst the, the papers that they have there. So this was from the Daily Telegraph, obviously. Uh, this particular paper was issued on July 8, 1996, but it's just a reprint of the Daily Telegraph paper that came out on Thursday, June 21st, 1877. This is just basically the day after it happened, and this is going to basically tell you what they thought happened right after it happened. Sorry this is a little blurry, but we're just going to have to deal with it. Picture of my camera is not very good. Origin of the fire. The fire was first discovered in a building owned by Mr. Fairweather on the south of York Point Slip next to McLaughlin's Boiler Shop. And to the latter building, the flames had spread before the firemen had reached the scene. So that's already in that first line. It's quite a bit different than back what they were saying in the official story where it started in a bundle of hay and then uh, by the time it was discovered the hay was burning out of control and then it caught the buildings on fire and this one's telling you that the buildings were on fire and the firemen were just trying to put the buildings out it had nothing to do with a bundle of hay so the engines arrived and did their best to stop the flames but their efforts were in vain nothing could be done the flames then spread to the various buildings on Hare's wharf which were also quickly consumed and before the fire could be checked it broke out with a roar into smith street so that sentence there kind of it broke out with a roar on the smith street that kind of sounds like an explosion like maybe it was set intentionally from there the flames spread onto drury lane oh shit the muffin man got baked that day yo <laughs> and mill street following that into dock street taking both sides Eerie this, however, the rear of the London house and adjacent buildings had been attacked by the fire. I mean, isn't everything burning down? Why, why would you need to say that it's being attacked by the fire if everything's already burning down? Like, that kind of sounds like somebody attacked it. Like, not just the fire burnt it, but somebody actually went and set it on fire, to me. So you can read this if you want to. Alright, let's hear about the squares. Queen Square and King Square and the other open spaces were speedily piled with bedding, chairs, tables, and other valuables. Then women and children gathered in the same spots, partly to try and watch their property, partly because they knew no places of safety. The burning of the bell tower the flight of the cinders in all directions and the danger of its falling on those who were near it produced an unpleasant sensation in the square. Okay, <laughs> the, the whole freaking city's burning down. <laughs> After the tower had been burnt to the ground, the danger had passed. And this is a picture of King Street, looking up King Street, at that bell tower before it fell, before the fire. A little picture there, pretty cool. And there's your uh, your bell tower right there at King Square, pretty sweet. It's got the Antiquitech on top, the flag was flagpole you see everywhere. And yeah, that's the old Trinity Church before the, the one that they have now, right? Like, wow. Alright, and here's another picture looking up King Square at it. It was pretty freaking big. Those are the people, that's a horse right there, right? All right, just one quick thing back on this uh, the museum's website here. I just wanted to point out, they always say here, everywhere you go, whatever website you want to go to, they always say, the tents were erected on the Barrack Green and shanties were rapidly erected on King Square and Queen Square as the homeless, sorry, as homes for people and businesses. So that's what they tell you, right? So they usually follow that story up with a picture like this where everybody's living in their little teepees and... It just, it looks so, you know, great, you know, they provided teepees for everyone. But then you find a picture in that same newspaper that I'm reading, and it says something like, King Square after the fire, encampment of the 97th Regiment. This is where the army people stayed. Where did the homeless people stay? 
who knows? They all, all the pictures always say that this is the homeless, but it says right here that it's the 97th Regiment. So here's some more of that article. If you want to pause it, you can you can uh, another part of the article, and it's. Well, you got the uh, the Trinity Church here, which I just showed you a picture of, and they're going to talk a little bit about the Victoria Hotel. I will show you that. So that's the old Victoria Hotel right there, big old brick building, and that is just looking up King Street. Doesn't look like the hill's as steep as it is today, but just could be an artist rendering. Both buildings have their antiquitech hanging out. So here's a little bit more of the article. And there is the St. Andrew's Church of Scotland. And this is the Trinity Church now. Adjoining the church was the two-story brick building occupied as a tailor shop in the lower store and Beacon Pioneer and Siloam Lodges of Odd Fellows as well as Misleet Encampment of that order had the upper flat. Some of the members managed to get into the buildings and save most of their regalia and paraphernalia prior to the building being destroyed. So we are going to go and check out their regalia. All right, what is, what, what's the odd fellows rocking with? All right, let's go check that out. So this is a picture from the 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 day of the fire. It's uh, got a little drawing here. It's got all these people running away. And here are the odd fellows running away, saving their regalia from destruction. Right? What are these two dudes right here holding? And they're both not looking at it. Both looking away. This dude right here looks like he's on point. He's going to start slicing people up that are trying to get close to it. This guy's got all their jive stuff. they got their, their sun discs. And what is that they're rocking with? Looks like the Ark of the Covenant. Be a replica? Maybe these mobs were going around destroying shit? we got to look more into that, I guess. A little bit more. The Music Academy, there's another building that we can check out. There is the old post office, and there is your Music Academy. Pretty nice looking building. Not bad, not bad. Look at those arches. Really uh, small dudes for the size of those doors, but, you know, that's just how they built them back then, I guess, right? And here's the next one. Explosions? When the fire had reached the Market Square and had obtained a stronghold on many fine buildings therein situated. Nice. Several explosions were heard coming from one of the hardware stores. They caused a general scattering of people about and reports reached as far as the courthouse. Explosions. Are they under attack? And they're just trying to play it off as, oh, that's probably just the hardware store. Interesting enough. So, if you were watching, if you paid attention to the first video I made, I went through some of the crazy facts about St. John and the crazy first setter here. One of them is the first clockwork time bomb was developed in 1880. So, the clockwork time bomb was fully developed right here in St. John in 1880. So, three years after the Great Fire and all these crazy explosions going on throughout the, the, the city of St. John. I find it kind of interesting, how long does it take somebody to develop a clockwork time bomb? You know, maybe people were setting these things up to test them out. Maybe somebody was originally doing the first one and blew himself to smithereens. That happens. I thought that was a little interesting for with the, the time frame that we're talking about right Just like uh, some really good thieves have been quoted as saying, you never let a good crisis go to waste. Of course, thieves have 
went and attacked the vulnerable. King Square shown immediately after the June 20 fire. When members of the 97th Regiment were camping in the square. So there you go. That's not people. That's not the homeless. That is just the military presence. Just set up shop. You guys go live somewhere else, and you don't get no insurance money either. So, all right, and when I was back at the library, I found this interesting little article here. It shows some pictures of the fire and them stuff, but I found the bottom to be really interesting. It says here, rebuilding suffers a setback with second fire four months later. They whole have this whole big jargon about this freaking organ grinder and his monkey and how he was, how he got a little elevated and did a bunch of weird stuff and I don't know, but it was literally four months to the day the second fire broke out and it was also at 2 30 but it was 2 30 in the morning this time not 2 30 in the afternoon and it started at main and acadia street oh yeah it says right here too that by the first week of october more and more citizens were becoming self-sufficient people requiring relief now numbered about 100 daily all requests were for provisions only so the people were becoming more and more self-sufficient they were getting back on their heels and then whammo another fire the fire whipped up its own wind and traveled in a southern direction towards the harbor by nine o'clock the fire was under control the flames consumed whole block of three three and four story houses about 120 buildings burned to the ground rendering 600 families homeless Many of those who were refugees of St. John who moved there after the after the first fire. So Portland is now part of St. John, but back then it was it was another town that was just a little bit north of us. And I guess it escaped the first fire, but four months later it, it got its own. Uh, once again, they found themselves out on the street. However, whatever possessions they had accumulated were lost once more. Most believed arson to be the cause of the blaze since no fire was kept where it originated. They speculate that this fire was a shady origin somebody going around setting fires they burning the rest of the buildings they didn't get in the first time by june of 1878 the shanties disappeared and hundreds of fresh new structures began to fill the void by the second anniversary in 1879 more than 90 percent of the city stood proudly back in place that is quite the rebuild wow 1612 structures 90 percent of them stood back in place not to mention the other 120 that burned down in a second fire that was four months later the new buildings, whether brick or wood, were larger and more comfortable than their predecessors. New building codes and wider streets made them safer too. Between then and the end of 1881, the remainder of the con reconstruction, mostly larger public buildings, was completed. After just four years, 1,100 new buildings stood in the burnt district. St. John's citizens literally witnessed the rebirth of their city. All right, more ruins just uh, inside the savings bank just burned out. It's like been exploded almost. Like, Sorry about the blurry picture here, but this is the Richie's building. Another blurry picture, Prince William Street, everything destroyed. That's the old uh, customs house. Roaming around, looking at it all, just burnt out. So this, in that same little article, there was this little nugget here. It was 125 years ago today, the Great Fire of 1877 leveled two-fifths of St. John. The blaze was so huge, the light of its flame could be seen in the evening from Fredericton, more than 100 kilometers away. How could they see flames from 100 kilometers away? Maybe because it's flat? And here's the picture of the all the devastation there, I guess. And then this is the beautiful new post office. That is what happened to it. So these pictures, they always show this picture, and I'm always kind of tripped out because I've never seen buildings down here. But in this picture, there's a building just chilling down here. They tell us this building is this building. 
but I've never seen buildings down here, but there's buildings down there. Here's a picture of the devastation as they walk through it. And there is a picture from the paper of the city just ablaze, just smoking away. Look at it. It's pretty much all gone. Friggin' Ark of the Covenant right there. Wow, look at that, eh? And here's another picture of all the people just leaving. The so I found this uh, picture here, and this is from Lost Valley Blog. Really good blog bought for, and a lot of pictures, good old pictures of St. John. So they have this picture of the burnt district everywhere that got burnt out. Up here, I believe this area or something like that is Portland. So that's where the next fire was. A, a tornado of fire, right? Some of the witnesses were calling this a tornado of fire. Fire. And doesn't that sound like a lot like California, Fort McMurray, and all the new fires that they have? Pretty weird if uh, maybe this was intentionally set and intentionally stoked. We had 15,000 people homeless by far one of the biggest city fires in Canadian history. <laughs> These photos for you that I was showing you guys, just as a reference. These are all, all pictures of everything all burnt out, the burnt district. Some crazy old photos, eh? What's that guy doing down there? Yeah. So these pictures were from the story of the Great Fire in St. John. Even on the very cover of this page, this is 1877 was the fire, right? So this is, I'm assuming, days after these people are walking through the rubble, they would already start knocking shit down by then. They have trickle poles. Why do we have electrical poles up in 1877? It tells you here that Thomas Edison started rocking the Pearl Street Energy Generation Plant in New York in 1882. So in St. John, uh, 1884, Electric Light Company uh, built the plant at Paradise Row. So in 1884, we had electricity, but in in this photo right here and many other ones we have hydro wires power wires here is a stereograph of market square north wharf st john and they give you from the museum 1872 to 1877 and there is electrical power towers look at that eh hydro poles right there right in plain sight and here is another one another stereograph from the North Wharf Market Square during the winter now. 1875, they gave you just a right on date, 1875, boom. And there we have power poles. This one here is getting a little closer, another stereograph of Chipman Hill, Prince William Street, St. John. And this one's uh, 81 to 83. And they already have a full street uh, going down here. In my searches, I stumbled on this website, and uh, while I don't know how exactly how credible it is, it does have some pretty interesting little facts about the Great Fire of St. John. You can read this if you want to as uh, I scroll down. So right here it says, The main business center in what had been one of the most prestigious cities in North America was wiped out on that day. 13,000 homeless is what they say here. They have a little breakdown of all the things, that, all the different stuff that got burnt down. You can read all this if you want. Some of this stuff is alright. So, they give you the same old jargon about haystack and uh, spark. Business owners throughout the uptown were already emptying their safes, trundling the contents to the Bank of New Brunswick, never dreaming that this stone building on Prince William Street could burn down, right? It's a stone building, and it burnt down. Like, what kind of fire are we dealing with here? The fire, fanned now by a gale force wind and possibly its own vortex, so there was fire tornado, was sweeping southwest and hopping across the street, riding the fire brands it threw up. Just read all about this stuff here.
Yeah, it says here too, uh, the Telegraph was one of nine newspapers whose offices were destroyed in the fire. Both it and the Globe got additions on the streets the next day by using borrowed uh, printing houses. Pretty interesting. It's like they destroyed all the media. Got all these small little media sources who couldn't afford to rebuild were all done. So here's some more for you to read if you want. You can pause it. Although the Bank of New Brunswick building fell in the fire, its underground vault and treasure with which it was hurled stuffed was undamaged. Hopefully all those people got their shit back. So they talk a little bit about the money that came in, from where and which direction it came from. Shanties and the encampment that uh, was at King Square. We all know that it's just the army camping out. All right, I thought this was a little uh, interesting fact here too, that it was uh, under the direction of the same architects who rebuilt Boston after it, if its great fire. A few overgrown foundations overlooked in the reconstruction could still be found as late as 1957. In 1964, a construction project on Water Street unearthed a safe believed to have been buried during the great fire. It was empty, <laughs> except for a key and some ashes. Yeah. So it's not really empty, is it? In 1988, renovations of a turn of a century Wentworth Street home uncovered a note left inside the wall by a disgruntled construction worker named John Edward. It read, came to this damn hole to get one and a half cents per day. May the devil burn the damn town to the ground again. <laughs> of course, he meant a dollar fifty. He was a construction worker, and education wasn't a big thing in, in that day. And here's the rest of this article here. So I found this part interesting. Rebuilding the city began with the removal of the ruins and debris. This proved to be a difficult and dangerous task. Wooden buildings left little more than a chimney behind. In the business district, where many structures were made of brick and stone, walls three or four stories high stood, crippled by the intense heat. Attempts to bring them down with cannon fire were largely ineffective. <laughs> they tried to shoot these things down with cannon fire. That's craziness. <laughs> just unleashing cannon fire on the city. Is this, was the city under attack? Or are they just trying to like hide it? Then the HMS Angus arrived from Halifax with the marine artillery which brought down the larger walls with bags of blasting powder. Pretty interestingly, so they just decided to shoot up the city and then, yeah, just bring it all down. Some guy, one of the guys actually died with it because they were doing all this craziness with the blowing it up and shooting it down. You can read a little bit more here.
you can always look up this website. I'll link it in the description. Um, I'll try to link all my websites in the description. I hope you guys enjoyed this video about the Great Fire of St. John. Thank you and uh, much loves to everybody.